in a nutshell, uh, before we launch into today's meeting, I just wanted to show you in case you haven't seen it yet. Um, our book is now live. So thank you everyone for all of your fantastic comments, uh, throughout the entirety of last year. If you're interested in checking out the book, it's now live as Substack. Um, you can start all the way, um, at chapter zero. Um, and once you upload from start here, um, you will then go forward bit by bit by bit through the individual chapters. Each of the chapter has our seminars from last year integrated now, uh, which means that you can actually look at uh, all of the videos that we've had in the past few, um, few, uh, yeah, in, in the past year, really. And uh, if you go on start here, you can immediately go to each chapter um, you can just click through if you're interested in it. You can subscribe to the book club. We're starting um, the official book club with more folks than just us um, starting in May. Uh, and you can also claim Gitcoin bounties. So every one of these chapters comes with Gitcoin bounties that we welcome you, oops, uh, that we welcome you to look at. So for example, if you're here on the first chapter, you can claim a bounty here and it should point you to this, this, uh, to Gitcoin immediately, which I think I have to sign in for. But anyways, I just want to let you know it's out there now. Uh, thank you all so, so much for having been such a big part of making this book happen. We will do an official launch for this group later, but we're also hoping that we get many of our previous keynotes presenters again to join us for the book club. So uh, there's more uh, about that later, but this is all enough for me. Today is really one of our more interactive exploratory sessions. Today's session actually is based on one of our books, which is um, uh, one of our book club chapters, which is um, Skim the Manual, Intelligent Bounty Cooperation. And so if you remember guys, we had Balaji here to present our network states last year, and he's probably joining again in a few weeks. But for now, we want to hear from all of you guys. So what we've been doing in the back end and through collaboration with a few of you um, is really just figure out what you guys are working on that's related to the topics that we highlight in the book. And so this is one of the more open brainstorms by which you all get to present your work and we just actually figure out how to make progress uh, on this. So if there's one thing that the book is supposed to do, then it's actually driving technological progress in these areas. So we just try to pinpoint a few of the areas in which it could be possible, but we ultimately rely on you and your projects. And so today we have a few really, really fantastic projects. This can be super off the cuff. If you prefer to have your presentation off the record, which is entirely possible, if you have something new to present, then I'll just turn off the recording. That's entirely fine. Um, but a few of you, I think, have already mentioned that uh, you're fine. In, in fact, uh, it was preferred if it was off the record. So I'm uh, really, really happy to be talking today about new 70s. Very, very happy to have such fantastic people here with me, like Eduardo, David, Tom Bell. Um, and I'm not exactly sure which way you want to start this off, but um, uh, maybe we will start it off. Tom, you are, you're always ready to go. In case you want to start it off first, I would make you a co-host. And we would love to have you talk a little bit about you, Lex. It's not the first time that you're presenting to a Fast Side seminar. In fact, um, uh, last time, I think it was together with Maiden Fields from DAOStack, and you were presenting ULEX there as a legal framework that I think many of the currently popping up uh, charter cities, special economic zones, and so forth could all really learn a lot from. So thanks a lot for your fantastic work. I think uh, it's really yeah quite uh, groundbreaking. And I think that a few folks, actually one of our fellows is currently starting a company in Prospera, so could probably benefit a ton from this. Well, thanks a lot for your work, and uh, I'm super looking forward to, you, to your presentation. I'll be in the chat to share a bit more of the info that I just shared verbally. Okay, I understand. Uh, Allison, hello. You're clearing me to uh, say a few words. I'm going to keep it at three minutes to respect your time because I want to hear from the other gentleman, and I'm running a clock. I want to tell you about three projects I have worked on or am working on, all of which incorporate a kernel of ULEX. In every case, they use the substantive rules of ULEX. One of them might be using the procedural rules. One is Prospera, the Zedic in Honduras. It's up and running. Very exciting things are happening there. I plan to visit again soon. Um, the next is Free Society, the Free Society project, but the sovereign we're creating is called Free Society. And of the three projects, it is the most decentralized. It is designed from the bottom up to be decentralized. Very interesting coding problems there. Uh, and it's in progress. We're getting very close to more public launches. Uh, parts of it have been circulating mostly among 
high powered law firms are getting a review from experts. Free society, very exciting. Third project to be, no kidding, to be announced soon, we hope. The tribe, I will say, is having, I prefer to call it the nation. So I'll say the nation. The nation, a symbol, is having a vote um, this coming. I'll leave it at that. They're having a vote, and soon we'll know whether or not the United States will have its first Native American special jurisdiction. In fact, I would say it'll be the first real special economic zone in the United States. Basically, the setup is um, Native American Indian lands, reservation, separate sovereignty, uh, an entirely virtual SEZ under um, the nation's law, and it will incorporate a kernel of ULEX also. With that, I'm going to pause and just repeat, and then I'll basically, I'll get one other thing and I'll go. So three projects, Prosper up and running, check it out. I plan to. Free Society Project in process. They have a website. I guess I can put it in the chat. It's very easy to find. It's the one with Olivia Johnson's at the head. And uh, then a team, I'm on the website. And then um, another to be announced soon, depending on how the nation, they're sovereign. They get to decide this sovereign nation will be voting soon. And I hope, you know, I'll be able to tell you more. I'm working on a paper now. I really hope this works out because I put a lot of work into this paper. It describes the legal foundations. Ooh, okay. I'm down to last 30 seconds. Um, all of these are decentralized to some degree. Um, one free society, decentralized from the bottom up. Super fun coding, difficult coding, best coding ever. And it uses the procedural rule, rules of ULEX. But um, all of them add to the decentralized polycentric nature of our coming I'm not going to call it the nation state. It's post-Westphalian international structure. It's going to be very polycentric. And um, each one of these nodes running the same kernel, so they'll get to have network effects, is kind of taking us further on that, uh, what I think is pretty much historically inevitable trend. And we want to go down that, those rapids in a controlled way. Oh, I'm two seconds over. I'm going to stop. Allison, I'll just hand it back to you and you'll choose somebody else, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I have a few questions up front, and I know we want to also skip through a few of the proposals here, but you you just um, yeah gave us a ton of information. I just want to say, could you maybe go in a little bit more detail what it is that you're doing with uh, Prosper? Like, uh, what what are like the current uh, uh, ongoing um, projects that? Oh, okay, this is danger zone. You didn't give me a clock, but I'll keep it. I'll keep it tight. Um, basically, I I I added to some of the code of the legal system of Prosper. And I don't want to take much credit here because it's a great edifice. Um, it's a whole operating system, okay? And I have ideas and I've worked on the other parts of the operating system, but basically these are just kernels. The, the, the Rotan common law code has a, a kernel, the substantive rules, which come straight from ULEX, which you've, your friends can find on GitHub. Um, I think they used version 1.1. I think it was up to 1.1 and now I'm using 1.2. It's on GitHub. You guys know where this goes. Um, and that's it, you know, and I helped him with coding other stuff too. And I got to say, I'm pleased with this. I think I can lay some claim to inspiring, let's say, some of their structural features, one of which I'm super happy about. I, I, I think it's led to, it's yet to see fruition, but it's um, the use of peer nation regulation. The idea is you can come to Prospera having won the regulatory approval of any one of a number of OECD respected countries, and you can bring those same regulatory practices to Prospera. And uh, you know, the, the implementation is tricky, but it's a great idea. It makes, it makes sovereigns compete head to head a little more and you get network effects, just like I hope we'll get network effects. I'm trying to create like a, an internet of these jurisdictions, right? And the, the, you know, the a common, not the only thing, but a common part of the code could be ULEX to increase their cooperation. Um, but, um, you know, I think, I think it's important to get other sovereigns in the game too. The more competition between governments, as long as it's peaceful, <laughs> the better. I like control the kind of, you might say commercial competition between sovereigns, but it, I wish it were commercial. Anyhow, so I'll stop there. Thank you for the, your question. Wonderful. Well, I have a lot more questions. Jim has one, and then we're moving on to the next presentation before we uh, um, basically have a, a proper discussion and a panel. Hey, Tom, I've been hearing that uh, the politics in Honduras have kind of turned against Prosper in the last few months. Could you address that? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Castro, the new president, one of her first announcements was her intent. She had a long list, a menu of sort of, um, to put it charitably, reforms that she's advocating. 
Um, and in the first item, there was a number of, of things in the first item and in there was the ZA program. And basically she was there not saying I'm going to, but she's sort of like, I will promote this, getting rid of the ZA program. She didn't specify why. Um, it's not hard to figure out reasons, plural, why that could be going on. And here we go. I'm going to say it's a good thing for prospering. It might be a good thing for the ZA system as a whole for a few reasons. First of all, regardless of Miss Castro's, might I say, bombast, <laughs> it's not as easy as she perhaps thinks at first blush to get rid of the Zetics. I was, I, I, I taught, I helped them with investor protection, but really the guy who did the most work there, someone I respect a lot, Michael Castle Miller, I brought him on other projects I've done. And he and some other people too, they had some great people did investor protection. And basically what that means for Prosper is, oh, if Honduras decides they want to get it, they get slapped pretty hard. You can take nations to court. You can get money damages. You can seize their assets. I'm not saying it's a perfect protection. It's one of a layered number of defenses that Prosper has. Now, what Castro can do, and I believe she will do, is she will change the composition of the Committee for the Adoption of Best Practices, known by its acronym, acronym CAMP. And it's one of the best innovations that Octavio Barriento Sanchez, a native Honduran, built into the Zeti system. He has it more or less... It's complicated. I wrote a paper on it. Look it up. Describing the whole system, pictures and everything. There is this kind of trust board of trustees, the camp. And so far, they've been people you would know, Jim. You probably know some of them. Some of them, personally, not all of them. Interesting group. Very classical liberal in the classic sense. And so Castro can change the composition of the camp. We thought about this in Building Prosper and how did we accommodate it. We made sure that our agreement with the then sympathetic camp, and this is basically given effect as law, in the Zeti structure is that regulatory changes within the zone become automatically effective and less negated by the camp. So the main concern with Honduran governance is, well, there's a lot of things to worry about, frankly, uh, but delay is a killer. And so if the Zeti has to count on the camp to approve its regs and it never acts, they can kill it by slow strang strangulation. So Prosper has a double layer of defenses. If they come after it, they can invoke international treaties, international law, international processes to protect their investment in Prospera, and they can get money damages from the government of Honduras, which does not need money damages. Honduras has a lot of problems. They don't need this fight. And secondly, because the, the ZA Prosper can keep rolling. It can keep going. It doesn't need camp's approval now. It's up and running. If it wants to make some changes, it has to go get camp approval, but in no wise can camp kind of walk in and say, we take over. That's not the way the Zeti system is structured by design by Octavio Berriento Sanchez, a brilliant man, native Honduran, built the Zeti system. I could go on and on about him. I met him personally. I'm a huge fan. So I'll stop there, Jim. Two reasons, and I could get more why it's, oh, and why is it good for their, it's good for Prosper because they can't get competition. There's two other ZAs up and running. They're quite different models. I know one of the guys running one of them. I don't know the other one so well. He, Prosper will not see any competition on the, the camp won't approve any more projects. Castro would be very angry if they did. I'm sure that's what's going to happen. You know, 85% sure. And that's okay. It's okay. Because check this out. Octavio uh, Benito Sanchez made it in the Zay system so that new property can be added to it without the approval of camp. Neighboring properties can by choice, they have to both parties consent, say, oh, I would like to accede to the zone. I'm putting my property in the zone. You don't even have to do this if it's contiguous territory. So just between you and me and everybody listening here, last thing I'll say, Octavio, Barriento Sanchez, build the Zeta system so that it could turn the whole country inside out. So not only are they not going to get rid of Prospera, they just made it the monopoly holder in the best spot for a ZA in the Honduran system. And they left it with this incredible, I don't want to call it a power. It's more like opportunity to let other people join their well-governed, effective, safe, prosperous jurisdiction. I'll stop there. Well, I would love to ask you a little bit more about, um, apparently Prosper also experiments with 3D property rights, modular construction, common law regulatory options, and so forth. Do you know anything more about the 3D property rights? That sounds like a potentially super interesting experiment. 3D property rights, 3D property rights. Is that what yeah, you're so, saying? Yeah, uh, so apparently, yeah, uh, uh, it says that Prosper wants to experiment with a bunch of new, I guess, like modifications and experiments uh -huh. in, in this area. And I think, I mean, part of what we really discuss in the book is a new way is using uh, crypto commerce as a new way to experiment with new types of property rights structures that are more 
adapted to the actual rights to do things that we care about. Um, yes. I think that's a very interesting topic, and I can't say a lot about free society. That part of the code is not public, but it definitely incorporates that view of uh, property rights. Not, you know, it doesn't chop up things meter by meter, which is what you do in a computer simulation. You could do. Uh, so I'll just pause here and say that stuff was done by brilliant people at Prosper, kind of after my watch. I was there for the early build, and it was, you know, it was a temporary gig. And it was great. I'm still friends with everybody there. And I, I worked in Honduras. I think I can make the claim to be the person who's worked the longest on Honduras continually, except for Octavio, <laughs> more so than anybody else. Because I got in with Patrick Friedman back in 2017, and I saw it through the, all the way through the, the I won't get into it, many disasters. So anyhow, um, I wasn't for there. I wasn't there though for that part of the bills. Free society will have what are sometimes called, I think, voxels, air units. And um, who's our third one? Oh, well, of course, the Indian projects will be totally virtual. So they're not going to have atmospheric space, but we can imagine modeling. I hope they do. I hope they model there. In fact, my dream, Allison, is to have a parallel virtual and uh, physical jurisdiction. And uh, I'm not the first person to think about this, but I feel it's like getting close. We could have a parallel kind of model um, economy to the actual owned physical property. By the way, last thing about Prospero, I'm glad you folks are interested in it. They are starting, this is again after my watch, this new project to make tradable crypto tokens, which are backed by the real property in the zone. And that could include real property, could include the airspace. Yeah, I heard that too. All super exciting and fits so well with Balaji's presentation on the network state as well. You know, we're just also using, trying to use the network state to actually coalesce and then negotiate property rights or like negotiate um, uh, actual citizenship in, in, in other jurisdictions and other countries. Okay, very cool. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom, for this uh, walkthrough. I want to hear a little bit more about you uh, in the panel, but for now, I want to hand it over to David. And David's uh, voting and um, working on a really, really exciting new voting platform for secure voting, which, you know, we definitely have to get better at uh, and, and around it. Um, and so, David, if you want to go for it, uh, afterwards, I have a few questions and then uh, we have another presenter. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, just to try to keep it concise, because there's a lot to cover. Um, at a high level for the last five or six years, I've been focusing on technology, governance technology, democratic technology, which involves all sorts of different problems. Um, very specifically, uh, or to make it a little bit more specific, one in terms of new sovereignties, there's been all these experiments that Tal was speaking about. There've been some other groups that I've been advising and helping to limited degrees. One's called Plumia, which is another networked nomad society. To a much smaller degree, I was advising a little bit people helping set up what was called BitNation at one point, and then um, and then Lieberland very very briefly, and um, one and then of course the high profile new sovereignty, the the one that a lot of people have heard about or more than than other things, is um, the talk about setting up Mars colonies, and one piece of the Mars colony that Elon Musk has talked about a lot is. Everybody ought to be able to vote from their phones. And so there's a bunch of technical things that make that a really hard problem. Specific to voting, it's, it's easy to do verifiable transactions. It's easy to authenticate transactions, which are both necessary. The part that's really tricky about voting is keeping it all privacy protecting. There's not supposed to be any administrator that can see how everybody's uh, taking actions. And so for the last few years, we've been building a lot of technology to make that super easy. I'm gonna share a screen. This is called Civ here. Um, it uses, it, it takes all these cryptographic shuffles and zero knowledge proofs of complete valid votes and makes it easy. And we've already been running lots of demo elections with this in the US with, with uh, election officials in the US and also internationally. We're talking with a bunch of Guatemalans now to help Juan Wallace set it up for many of their expats. And then a separate project for, for new sovereignties, especially a lot of these DAOs are trying to do interesting new governance experiments, but they're all facing the civil problem. Um, you know, trying to make sure people are represented proportionally, balancing that out with token weighted voting, which is also interesting, both have different benefits. And so we've been working for, for many years on neutrally credible identity verification, which is the hard part. There's lots of centralized identity verification, centralized KYC systems. But what we've been working on is a protocol for decentralizing the KYC. So you don't have custodial risk where one individual party has the ability to create new people 
and making the entire process privacy protecting and making the entire process reusable. So there's some really interesting work here, which is sort of like the, one of the foundational elements you need to enable people to be represented in a digital sphere and digital context. But then by far, in my opinion, the most interesting thing, though, these two are really aspect, are really interesting logistical aspects and, and technical problems. But in my opinion, the far more interesting thing is, is how we can represent ourselves much better and what, what can representative democracy uh, evolve into. And one problem that, again, and talking about the Elon Musk example, is he says he imagines that this million person Mars colony would be a pure direct democracy because he's had so much frustration with electoral representatives and how um, underrepresentative and misrepresentative that system really can be and how much it centralizes power and makes it susceptible to, to corruption and, and influence. And so this is just kind of showing a simple example. You can imagine all these are individual citizens and we put one person in the center of the system to represent it. This is a 25 to one ratio. In the real world here in America, we have a much closer to a million to one ratio. And so it concentrates so much power in the hands of one person in the middle. My friend Greg has this metaphor about if you put everybody in a, in a football stadium trying to make decisions, the representative would be by volume, the proportion would be the size of a hot dog. And so right now we're all participating in hot dog worship, hoping that we elect the right hot dog and the hot dog makes good decisions. And so it's, a, it's an extremely centralized system compared to the world because it was created hundreds of years ago in a much smaller world and it hasn't scaled as our world's changed. And so the power, what we can do now that we have these digital systems is have much more of a network-based representative democracy. And what that means is that everyone can have one vote, but also it's hard to, it takes a lot of time and energy to really research policy. Policy is complicated, it has a lot of details, just like we're not expecting everybody to program our own computers. We're not expecting everybody to fly their own airplanes. It's good to have people be able to become experts on individual policy decisions. And so this model, sometimes referred to as liquid democracy. I actually don't like that name all that much. I prefer um, personalized representative democracy or decentralized representative democracy. But the basic idea is you get to pick your own representatives and representation becomes backup representation. So you can always weigh in yourself, but people are still accumulating voting power in a much more organic way. So it means that our representative systems can kind of resemble sort of more like the content creation that we see on YouTube or Instagram, where anyone can start creating immediately, but then we accumulate more and more followers, except those systems are based on interest. This is based on trust. And so we can just have way more options, way more choice, way more accountability over our representation. We can have a much closer relationship between citizen and representative. Right now, the vast majority of people have no idea who the representatives even are. Certainly the representatives rarely know who the citizens are. And then the other really interesting aspect, not that those aren't, that has all sorts of fascinating implications. The other interesting aspect is that our representatives can even become, they don't necessarily need to be people. We could outsource some of our decisions in topic by topic areas to organizations. So maybe we really like the Cato Institute or the Sierra Club or the NRA or the anti, the every town anti-group. And so we can directly be represented on individual topics, but even more interestingly, there's a lot of talk of, um, you know, having AI that knows your preferences better. The scary part in my mind is saying, okay, we're gonna have one AI that decides for everyone. But if we have this sort of model, we can have a marketplace of representation. And so different people can be saying, okay, here, I made a system that I think is gonna predict, predict how you wanna be represented better. And at the end of the day, each individual still has that choice and accountability and can replace it at any time. The, the AI representation is one interesting idea. Another really popular model is what's called deliberative democracy, where you have these like jury panels, random sortition assemblies. There's a lot of interesting ideas there, but there are details to be worked out. And so the power is that this sort of system allows for a marketplace of representation. And so you can have competing implementations instead of only having one singleton implementation. And then the really interesting thing that many people in this group are very familiar with, and many people in this group have worked on, is the futarchy prediction market-based legislation, which I think is extremely fascinating. There's a lot of people that don't understand how markets work at all, and so they're not as enthusiastic about it. But again, the power of this type of model is that it's completely inclusive of all sorts of different representation. So the people that like futarchy could just start representing, could just start delegating to it immediately, 
and we can start experimenting with it on a much smaller scale in a much more flexible way. And so I personally am very excited about this as a model for 21st century democracy, for internet age, information age democracy, for how we can have representation and still have accountability from our representatives in a way that gets a much better ideal of both worlds of, um, of inclusion and consent to the governed, but not create, not concentrating too much power. And so there's a lot of new sovereignties that are really interested in these ideas and old sovereignties that are interested in ideas and, and working with these in, in existing systems. So that's all I wanted to share for now. Thank you. And so let's talk more about it. Wow, I love it. I mean, I have so many questions already. I, I want to see if someone else has a question. If so, please raise your hand. Uh, for example, one uh, was, um, have you heard of Pactum? Pactum is basically an AI for Pareto preferred negotiation that you can already use as like a template. And so it could be really interesting to slot that in the middle so that the different AIs can also use a Pareto preferred negotiation tool to coordinate better when they represent individuals. Um, if you haven't heard, I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat here. But um, yeah, I mean, it all sounds super exciting. Do you have any idea of how like, are you hoping to like try that or sandbox that first with the DAO or um, or how? Yeah, yeah, there have been a bunch of DAOs that are interested. We, we just spun up in the last two months a new thing called Liquid DAO specifically to make these tools as like a off the shelf option for DAOs to adopt and, and start using immediately. Um, we've also been doing a lot of experience in our existing government. So we've done a bunch of pilots with 10,000 voters or so throughout the US. We worked with a lot of representatives. What a, what a lot of people have done, including myself and about a dozen other people, people have run for office in the existing system and said, if I get elected, I'll make all my decision, all my voting powers based on this new model as like a remote control politician. And it's a crazy idea. But then what's the powerful thing about that is it means that we can start experimenting with these immediately without requiring constitutional amendments or, or state charter amendments. And like in my case, it was for the California State Assembly. So there's 80 positions. I was only running for one. The other 79 would say this way they are. And so we can start using this right now in the thing that's controlling trillions of dollars of our tax money and actually locking people in cages and, and making really important in, uh, impact decisions on people. So that's been really exciting. Cool. And have you looked at all at integrating already with specific prediction markets for the future key model or like, you, you know, you should talk to Metaculus or something that could be extremely interesting. Yeah, I was talking to Gaia at, um, at the bird's nest at the last event. It was super fun. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Amazing stuff going on in the space. Yeah, we'd love to support all, all the merit. The other problem with future key or, or the technical problem that is still to be solved is just, um, like with, with the Merkle DAO proposal, for example, is you do need to identify people. You, you still need a, a, a authentication system so you can say, okay, here are all the citizens. And so having all, there's a lot of overlap in the problems that need to be solved for one can be repurposed to create the foundation to try all sorts of different future key experiments and things like that. There's huge amounts of collaboration possible. Wonderful. Okay, very cool. Um, we have David with a question. Well, not exactly a question. I wanted to suggest an interesting way of making a continuous transition on this is that you say that any group of, say, a million voters can have their own representative, non-geographical, at which point they get pulled out of the population counts of the states in which they're in. So you could imagine a continuous transition in which you say, if, if I have a million representatives, I get a seat in Congress. We've got a limited number of seats in the legislature. Uh, and people can, can then choose between the option of the present system and the option of your, your liquid, liquid democracy system. That's all. It just struck me as an interesting patch to the stuff you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point. And one of the things we found was when, like when I was running for office there, there's all these details of how exactly it gets worked out. And so we were sort of intentionally encouraging each of these liquid candidates to do slight variations on the rules so that we can experiment with things like that. Like another one that was very popular is people would say, we need a certain threshold for it to actually be binding. We need some participation rate for it to actually be binding so that you don't just have a tiny number of people deciding for everybody. And so preserving that flexibility to be able to tweak these different parameters, I agree completely. You know, the more experiments we can see, the better. 
Lovely. Okay, we have Chip up next. Yeah, uh, the, 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 this liquid democracy idea is something I thought, I thought about a lot in variations over the years, but one question that, that has always puzzled me is sort of the, the legislation drafting, the regulation drafting piece of the puzzle, which is what legislative bodies do. Um, there is certainly there is voting to decide, well, do we pass this law or not? But then there's a whole non-voting process that is, you know, the, the actual coming up with the text of what is, what is the thing that's going to be voted on? And I don't see how you distribute the, the, the decision-making authority in this sort of, this sort of, uh, uh, sort of tributary network model, um, uh, for doing that part of the process. It seems like it would leave a lot of power in the hands of, of sort of the administrative bureaucracy that necessarily surrounds any kind of governance procedure. Yeah, I, I think you're hundred percent right. The details of like. A, a, a individual line in the legislation can have such a massive impact on, on the whole system. Um, my personal, the model that I, the mental model that I'm working from is that, um, moving the primitives of who even has the authority over it is sort of a very powerful first step. And then the systems that build these things can be experimented, can, can, can come out from that. For example. I mean, I, I imagine that things would look a little bit more like the way the Bitcoin improvement protocol process works, where it's a very similar problem in that technical experts are arguing over, you know, do we use these Schnorr signatures or do we use this particular thing? The vast majority of people can't really understand how it works. And it, again, you have code, you know, law is code, code is law type of thing, the, the, code, the legal code base. And the, but then ultimately there's some sense that the process has some legitimacy because any programmer can, can push a pull request, can push a particular patch to the system, but it does need to be adopted by the miners. And so in the Bitcoin system, it's what percentage of hash power controls the thing. I imagine we'd have a similar sort of thing, like the Linux project has for years been figuring out how do we make sure that code that's getting pulled, pulled into the project is verified by multiple people. And in these cases, because it'd have even more of an impact, it would need way more verification. So I 100% agree that this is a very big and important problem to figure out, but I don't think it's a impossible problem by any means. I think it's a problem that I personally am excited about, you know, what sort of good solutions can we come up with and pushing things forward. And the, I mean, the, the other contrast, just again, take think of the status quo is right now, there are these bills that are hundreds of pages or thousands of pages of bills that are getting changed at the 23rd hour and lots of representatives are voting on them without ever having read them. I mean, there's uncountable examples of that happening right now. So that's not to say um, that we, I, I think we can do better. And I mean, I, I, the hope is that it's strictly Pareto dominant, that it's better across every dimension and both outcomes and sense of legitimacy. Already dominant. I love it. Okay. Very cool. Well, there's more questions in the chat, but um, I think in the interest of time, we are having uh, Eduardo and then we have you guys on the panel. I should also, I guess, you know, maybe we can discuss it more on the panel, but uh, you know, the security part of uh, the voting, as you mentioned, is probably like, you know, something crucial to get right. And currently uh, David um, and a few others and I are collaborating on a more computer security and cryptography focused conference or smaller workshops later this year. And so there's probably more to share on that front. So we're certainly trying to make progress there as well. Okay, cool. So next one up, we have Eduardo. Eduardo, if you want to go. Thanks, Anson. Um, very, very happy to meet everybody here. So I was a Caltech graduate student into last year when I defended my PhD. And for the past uh, four years at Caltech, we've been running uh, a weekly discussion group comprised almost entirely of uh, graduate level scientists, technicians, engineers, uh, about countries, about policy, about history. Um, and to my surprise, it became like super, super attractive to like a sizable fraction of, of the Caltech community that usually you think are just like scientists don't care about the world at large. Um, this has been going on for uh, every week for the past four years. Uh, now that I 
graduated, uh, Michael Zheng, who is also here, is, is now the president. Hey, Michael. Um, but Michael also defended his PhD last week. And so we are figuring out how to transition this a group into uh, something a little broader than Caltech. Uh, we are turning into uh, uh, 501c3. Michael is spearheading that process. Um, and we are, uh, you know, really inspired by what Foresight uh, has done, by how Foresight uh, fostered community around the set of interests. Uh, and we want to, we want to do something similar. Uh, we are not, you know, 100% sure about, uh, what the future looks like. Uh, but we are pretty sure, uh, that it's bright, uh, that we got some of, uh, the brightest minds, uh, attending our weekly, uh, brainstorming and discussions. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, leave, uh, an invitation for anybody that, uh, is interested, uh, just, uh, you can get in touch with me or you can leave your email on, on the chat. Um, and we will add you to, to the mailing list. We meet every Wednesday at 6 PM. Uh, and the point is, uh, we don't know quite yet, uh, what is going to happen, but we are pretty sure that with the group of people that we are assembling, uh, a lot of good things, uh, will come out of it. Yeah. I'm loving, um, getting all of your emails. And uh, you certainly have like a really stellar list of folks. Also a big overlap with Foresight community. Um, uh, I, yeah. Do you have any further thoughts on what this nonprofit could possibly do? It's extremely exciting and I had no idea. Um, we have a number of ideas on like special projects and crazy things and getting some people to run for Congress, uh, and also supporting like, uh, some initiatives in Brazil where I'm from. Uh, but right now they are, there are ideas that might crystallize a little better, uh, over than the coming year. Cool. Do you just want to maybe give a heads up? Because I think not everyone knows, uh, um, about the discussions that were going on there. Just who were maybe your favorite presenters or what were your favorite discussion topics? What can people expect when they join? Uh, I'm going to let Michael, uh, answer that one since he is now running, running the show. Okay, sure. Uh, so our main focus is on geopolitics. So, um, like literally yesterday we had a meeting where we invited an Ukrainian graduate student to tell us about the Ukrainian Russian conflict. And, uh, just for, you know, added context, we also have a Russian student who is there, you know, joining in the discussion. Um, yeah, so we've also had, uh, presentations on Morocco from a Moroccan student. Uh, we invited a podcaster from the history of Africa podcast to tell us about Axum, which is, uh, ancient Ethiopia. And in the next month, um, I want to start a world religion series where I'm going to go out and like, uh, go to a church, go to a mosque, a synagogue, you know, a, a temple and invite their priests to come and tell us about their religion. But, you know, it's one thing for us to tell us about their religion. I think what's uh, more special about this club is that the presentation might be 20 minutes, but then there's like an hour, two hours of questions. So it's really a much more discussion focused than, you know, a presentation focused and yeah, you're all welcome to come. Um, yeah, just leave you an email. We meet every Wednesday at 6 PM. And also if you want to speak about any topic relating to sovereignty, yeah, send me an email. Or send me a message and I'll get you on the uh, list. So there's no shortage of folks. Okay. Very cool. Michael, it's really nice to meet you, um, uh, virtually. Um, okay. Very lovely. Well, we're also, we're discussing potentially a few co-hosted events. I'm hoping that you will join, um, or uh, I think Eduardo at least is joining, uh, Foresight's, um, global meetup. So, uh, we have global meetups again on, uh, February 26th. And so that would be across eight cities now uh, globally uh, in collaboration with a few DAOs and other organizations like Vida DAO and 1729, like Apologies, Network State, and so forth. And that will be in San Francisco. So I don't know, Michael, if you're in the area broadly, but uh, if you are, it would be really lovely to see you there. And I'm hoping everyone else uh, who was interested joins too. Um, okay, cool. So thank you so much, Michael, for that. Uh, I will now ask you on a panel, <laughs> which we'll do virtually. Uh, and I have the first question that I want to ask all of you. And then uh, I would love to uh, give it up to our other questioners, which is what is the number one challenge that you want to see solved to move your field forward? And perhaps we start with 
uh, Tom. So Tom, if you could tomorrow wave your magic wand and solve one challenge um, to move your work forward, what would that be? What's the biggest bottleneck? Wow, that's a good one. Uh, I wish you would have warned me. Um, of course, everybody wants to go for peace, but I will say I want to bring peace between nations. So if they'd stop, uh, no, that's quite tried, but it's true. It's true. If I could wave the magic wand and get rid of um, a lot of shooting by sovereigns and we could get it to negotiations and that's, you know, I like guns and all, but I, I'm better at talking. I want to get it on a playground where I can, where we can all make some headway and, you know, have, have um, less hurting by sovereigns. Okay. And could you maybe be more specific on like what specifically would help ULEX along? Like what's a challenge that ULEX is currently facing? Like what, what would be the next steps there? Cause you're. Oh, specifically of that. I got to figure out GitHub better. It's uh, it's crazy. I know I have coded, but I just uh, feel like I don't have mastered it well. So if you want to help out on GitHub, I could use some help. I need to do an up, another upgrade in uh, um, ULEX. I think I'll call it 1.2a, maybe, maybe 1.3. There's not big changes, but working with clients in the real world, basically solving their problems with ULEX, doing these installs, right? It has revealed to me some things about ULEX that, are, you know, I can improve, that it'll be better. I would like to see more jurisdictions running the procedural rules of ULEX. I'm really excited about the appellate process. I've studied uh, in the context of DAOs uh, using oracles to get data from outside the system into the system. Very hard problem. Very hard problem. By the way, uh, David Ernst, solving identity in a decentralized way. If you've done that, respect, man. But anyhow, back to um, the uh, appellate procedure. It's a completely decentralized appellate procedure, which is designed to scale potentially infinitely, but it won't because basically your chances of, of affecting the outcome of the prior decision. We're talking about, you know, adjudicated procedures and a stacked tier of appeals. You need to have a way to settle appeals and uh, check it out. ULEX, uh, the procedural rules have what I think is an original, uh, hopefully it's like novel and useful um, voting structure that allows you to adjudicate disputes and can be used in DAOs for oracles. You use a prediction market type structure with appeals decided by that procedural rule. I think you've solved the hard problem. So that is a hard problem I want to solve. Oh, very cool. Okay, quite specific too. Uh, okay, wonderful. Uh, next one up, we have David. David, what's the problem that, like a challenge that you're facing? Something that, you know, could really move the needle um, uh, in terms of secure voting? Um, I, I also have a short answer to the sovereignties one. Uh, before getting go for it, go for it. Yeah, well, and the sovereignties one. My my partner and I, we're super interested in the idea of moving to a startup society, moving to a startup city, and participate in this thing. But we have the huge problem of, as Americans, we get double taxed, and so all the supposed economic benefits, uh, we we're we're facing a massive handicap. So that's something that's very much on my mind. Um. So the specific problem of voting, secure voting, um, I don't know. I mean, we're making pretty good progress. There, there's a lot of, there's a horrible PR on the issue. I mean, just awful, awful PR on the issue, which is comes from a very good place because of course people want the, you know, we depend upon our process being secure and legitimate and everything like that, which I agree with hundred percent. I think the slight frustration is that a lot of people don't go into these discussions saying, how can we make things better? But they kind of come in with predetermined, oh, I've already decided that writing messages on dead trees is inherently more trustworthy than electrifying silicon. When it turns out you can do both of those in smart ways, you can do both of those in, in unsavvy ways. So I don't know if people could be better critical thinkers, that would be great. I don't know if that's gonna happen anytime soon, but I think we're making good progress step by step. Excited about what we have in the pipeline, very in the, in the coming few months, especially. Okay, wonderful. Michael or Eduardo, what's up next for you? What are specific challenges you're tackling? Either for new sovereignties in general, what would you like to really see solved to make problem progress on this problem or for your project in particular? Well, uh, the number one thing that I wish to see in the world, uh, you know, throughout my life is good governance. Um, that's a big ask, um, but there is one specific, uh, action point, uh, that I realized, uh, throughout my years at Caltech, uh, that can make a huge difference on that, uh, which is engaging, uh, and really inculcating a feeling of empowerment in competent, technically trained people, uh, you know, 
that are able to make a gigantic difference uh, if they become involved uh, in aspects of public life, in aspects of society. Um, the number one thing that shocked me, uh, you know, being at Caltech and then stepping out of Caltech, uh, volunteering into the, the state assembly, uh, and then graduating and going on about life is how people underestimate themselves at a, at a place like Caltech and many other excellent people. They think that they cannot actually do anything. Uh, when in reality, they just don't understand how the system works and they don't understand how well positioned they are to do things. Um, and so from an action point, uh, the kinds of things that I would, that I wish to foster, uh, with sovereignty club, uh, and throughout my life is to, uh, empower, uh, good people to, uh, and help them understand, uh, how the work works, how the government works, how society works, and then connect them with other people, uh, that can help them, uh, in do those things. Because basically what I have to do is you have to have a good model of reality understand where you can act and understand who can help you act on those things. Right. Uh, and Caltech is a very, like, it's kind of like a monastery of science, like some people say, like it's very isolating, uh, in the sense of uh, people to get hyper-focused in the incredible technical work. Um, but in a sense, they don't potentialize it by just pairing it with elements of the rest of the world that can, that can, uh, make the impact like so much, so much bigger. Um, and so that is my answer. I wish, uh, I wish to empower, uh, and connect, uh, highly qualified people, uh, to make a difference, um, uh, uh, you know, focused on public life. Oh, okay. Well, I have a question relating to this, which is how do you all, um, think that we could potentially overcome the network effects that are related to, like, it's really, really difficult to get a lot of people to. Um, let's say move to a new sovereignty or actually even just participate in a new sovereignty, whether it's virtual or whether it's physical, um, you know, both of the, like, I mean, it's the same problem with like moving from one social network to a different one. Right. And so I think solving this problem is pretty di difficult. You could, for example, use a uh, dominant assurance contracts, maybe, uh, something that Alex Heber presented on earlier by saying, basically, if enough other people commit to, uh, to moving or to using a certain system, you do so too. But uh, there are, I think, a few problems that, yeah, we need to figure out. And have you thought about this at all? Because you mentioned you want to empower young, young people and they don't often know exactly how they can be empowered and move together. But, you know, you could come up with pretty like interesting smart contracts by which, you know, you could actually coordinate folks to be using a, a, a certain system uh, a little bit yeah, yeah, together and to try it out. So I have thought about this, uh, you know, I grew up in Brazil. Uh, which is a place with a very uh, dysfunctional government. Uh, and I, I've thought about this more from the social angle, right? Uh, what I see a lot in Silicon Valley is that like technology uh, alone uh, will solve the problems. Uh, but in a place like Brazil, where like 30% of people uh, live in misery, like you really need to be hands-on. Uh, software alone uh, can't uh, address all the challenges. Um, the specific way in which I would go about, you know, in the direction of what, of what it described is, uh, to nu nucleate groups of people in these places. And, and I would begin with like larger cities in countries that have functioning democratic institutions, nucleate these groups, uh, probably in universities, because that's where you have people that have like time, uh, and like are a certain community of like really good, smart tech, um, and then connect them with people that are actually doing things, uh, in their country and in the rest of the war and show them like what they can do, right. Help support them in figuring out their local environment and how to go about doing things in that environment, because in the end of the day, there's no one size fits all solution. It's always going to be culture dependent. It's always going to be. Uh, geopolitics dependent and, uh, nobody knows all the places, but the people that live in a certain place, uh, that th think deeply about things, no, can, can figure out ways to go about it and make a difference where they are. Um, so, so that's how I would, uh, address this. I would nucleate local, uh, 
local groups with people that understand the local uh, setting. Wonderful. Thanks, David. Any thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I agree completely. And I think moving, moving structures down, like trying to do things that it would be great if we could push more of the governance down to much smaller scales. It seems from my perspective that a lot of the issues that we face are trying to get 150 million monkeys on the same page is a very hard problem. And being able to have a lot more flexibility on, on local scales and having you know, 50 different states or thousands of different states that we can, that we can move with our feet to me, it seems extremely exciting and promising. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's sort of where my, my first instinct lies. Well, is there any one particular, let's say, um, uh, virtual coordination tool or something that you're excited about? I know that there are a few, for example, um, I recently went to a Praxis meetup in San Francisco, which is now. Uh, one of the the uh, the new, uh, I guess, like new sovereignties uh, that I is, is actually trying to negotiate physical territory, and then obviously there's like Biology seventy twenty nine. There's a few other projects in that regard that are currently gearing up, like the whole crypto nations, um, crypto nation, um, yeah, movement really. Uh, do you have any in particular that, um, you know, uh, that you are a member of that or that you be moving with, or do you have any, yeah, uh, do you have a favorite? Um, I, I, I hate to sound, uh, squeamish, but I feel like this group is a collection of people whose ideas and contributions I really appreciate and, and, uh, always look forward to hearing from, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are a few others like that. Um, I think the one, the, the one thing that gives me pause, there's so much enthusiasm in these DAOs, in these sort of societies. Again, the part that just gives me pause is. Like I'm paying a third of my income in taxes, or if not more, if you count all the state taxes. So if I'm working five days a week, I'm really working two days a week for the federal government. So I'm wary of um, neglecting all of that so much because just making a 1% improvement in efficiency translates into so many tens of billions of dollars, as opposed to these parallel groups which to me, the power of the parallel groups doesn't come from the short-term impacts they can make, but the, the demonstration that they can be, the, the positive example that they can be to then bring back to these group to the existing incumbents. So yeah, I don't know. I, I have very complicated feelings on, on all these subjects. Well, very interesting. I mean, I think to some extent we are already doing this organically when you mentioned this group, like this is some like definitely like, you know, some kind of jurisdiction in which we are um, often meeting, collaborating, cooperating. And now I think that we have the global meetups and that are also not only for foresight, but they're also across DAOs and other organizations. I feel like we're already doing this polycentric uh, DAO collaboration model a little bit and are collaborating across virtual jurisdictions, but by also meeting in the physical world. And I think one thing that to me is often missing from the crypto nations projects or from a few of them, uh, at least, is that many of those people haven't actually actually lived together. And that's something different, you know? Like, I think sometimes you have like a lot of uh, goal alignment, but it's not nevertheless, or like living together is still like quite a different beast. And I think one really interesting bit is like in San Francisco, there's so many communities, right? Like I'm part of a community house. There's like a bunch of others too. And I think like bridging more between the physical world and the communities that already live together, plus then the ones that actually want to do more of the regulatory arbitrage thing, could be a really fruitful way to combining more the virtual layer with the physical one. And there's a bunch of my friends now that are actively trying to seek out space in Portugal and so forth to move to. So I feel like it's definitely coming. And if we could have a really good model by which different people could coordinate better and then have their own voting procedures in place, I, I really think that there could be a few communities now that I know of that would personally make total use of this. So yeah, very, very exciting and very actionable. Okay. Uh, and last one up, we have Tom. Tom, what is your answer? Alison, can you repeat the question? I was getting distracted by your idea of people living together. I like that. I think Zach, actually you should go into it with virtual versions. So I got distracted by that. What was the question again, please? Well, you can also totally comment on the virtual uh, nation split. Okay, I will. <laughs> yeah, okay, do that, do that. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm gonna repeat what you said. I think it's a great idea, but I was enjoying the chat too much. Um, you got smart people here. I like the 
I like their ideas. Um, yeah, I like your idea of people living together. I think that's an important, necessary step to building a really a real community. Humans are still humans. They like to be together for good reasons and bad, um, <laughs> but they need to be together. Uh, most of us, a fair portion of the time. But that's a huge step, as you know. Most people can't go straight from where they are, especially when they're so isolated these days. If we were already living in communities, it might be easier, but most people aren't, frankly, um, to, to get them to actually make the physical move. So if you could bridge that gap with a virtual kind of living space, I know it's kind of fakey. You really need to be together with people to actually smell them, if I can be kind of blunt, to really know what it's like to be in a community. But, you know, it's hard to get there. That's a big first step too big for people you want to have in your community. So if you could somehow, then I'm not the guy who does this, but design a, an intermediary place, I don't think it's enough to have it be a social hangout. I think there should be something like cross insurance uh, connections among these people, forming what the, the Anglo-Saxons called in a very decentralized legal system. I learned about this from David Friedman, <laughs> about the, the BOR, B-O-H-R, um, in Anglo-Saxon, he'll probably now correct me, the poor, the OHR, the Anglo-Saxon legal systems. And it was a group of like eight uh, to 12, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yield men or, you know, free men who would pledge for each other's behavior. And basically this uh, did a number of good things. It protected innocence from at least uncompensated wrongs. And it created great incentives within the group for policing by the people who were up close and personal. Because these are people who knew each other, you know, in the same community. Um, how do you do that online? I don't know. Again, I'm not the guy who designs these, but if we could have something like virtual BOHRs, BORs, uh, I think the financial incentive aspect is important. So it's not just a social hangout. Then maybe it'd be easier for people to actually get together. And I'm hoping to have places for them to get together. I mean, Prosper is a great place if you want to do it. If you really want to go, no, I want to be there in person. Go to Prosper. I've been there. It's beautiful. It's a tropical island, okay? It's got reefs just offshore. I love the place. I can't wait to go back. I mostly speak English too, because my Spanish, uh, no sabe. Love it. Very cool. Yes, I just posted David's book here in the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, you should definitely check out David's book. Uh, um, um, I think it's learning from uh, legal systems, very uh, different from ours, or really very alien from ours. It's really, really fantastic. It has lots of different case studies in there. I, I think it was the one that you were referring to. But uh, I think, you know, we both met, actually, Tom, we both met at the seasteading conference, right? Like <laughs> years ago or something in Tahiti. So quite some time ago. That's true. We first met in the real world. Okay. You and your charming at sister. Time, we're at time, this was incredibly exciting. I know there's much, much more to discuss. I do want to invite you guys to join our Discord, which is kind of our virtual nation stage for now. Um, and yeah, please continue uh, collaborating in our Intelligent Corporation channel. That's on our Discord, and that's where all of you guys are members of. So if you want to continue the co uh, conversation, I invite you to go there. I'm also happy to share any um, further information that you guys want me to share, or just feel free to drop it in the email chain that we have. But I would say Discord is perhaps the best uh, way to co coordinate there. Uh, thank you, all three of you, for joining. It was really, really fantastic. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you all at the next one. Uh, the chapter that is corresponding to this session I already posted uh, I, earlier uh, here in this talk. But in case you want to reach up to uh, read up on it again, and in case you're interested in learning more, here's the chapter again. I would be super happy if these meetings that we're doing could actually become more working groups. So the reason why we wrote the book is to actually kickstart collaboration, right? And so if you're interested in actually joining a working group on New 70s and on uh, basically having more collaboration across your project, and being able to form a bit of a community around that, I would super welcome that. That is, you know, our mission in the book to really kickstart new ways in which communities can form across, like around the different chapter ideas that we have in the book. And so this one is totally focused on new sovereignty. So if you're interested in just collaborating on this more and like learning more about new tools together, potentially experimenting with a few of them amongst ourselves, I invite you to join our Intelligent Corporation channel, which I posted on the Discord. Um, and maybe we can hash something out I would certainly always be up for uh, scheduling follow-up meetings of this um, for smaller groups or uh, um, for different follow-ups uh, for this. But I would say maybe the best thing is we can coordinate this on the Discord. Does that sound good? All right. Thank you, guys. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for staying on two minutes longer. And I will see you on Discord in the Intelligent Corporation chat. Bye.